Scott, you're live. Good evening, everyone. This is the Grosseville Place Golden Pedestrian Advisory Commission. I call the meeting to order at 7:44, and ask everyone to follow along with the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States, United States, America. States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, which it one stands, nation under one God, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, indivisible, with liberty, and justice for and all, justice for all. Amazing, we made it through. That's the first time I've had to do that on uh, a Zoom call. So I apologize if it got butchered over here. I think there's a little bit of a time delay trying to keep everyone in unison, but not sure if that worked out. Either way, we got through that. So um, before you, you should have the agenda. Um, is there anything that needs to be changed on the agenda as presented? Hearing none, we'll move on. Um, I mentioned that as far as roll call, that um, you know that Christine is on the call. You know, uh, so we cannot see her, but you know she is on the call, and that Dan is trying to uh, you know get in as of right now. So if for some reason he cannot, he is excused uh, from this meeting. So with that being said, uh, I move on. Um, we do not have minutes before you to approve tonight. Um, when uh, we find them, you know, we'll uh, bring it back probably at our, our next meeting in order to make a formal approval on those meeting minutes. So um, next we would have public comment. I am not sure if we have anybody from the public that is willing to talk about something either on the agenda or not. So I'll defer to, to Brian Friel to let us know if there is anybody on the call. as he walked away um hearing none we'll move on and if there is somebody later on we will entertain that notion so um with that you know we can go straight into update uh, you know we just have a few updates to share with the public in general uh no actions tonight the first is about bike path maintenance so if you recall last year last september i believe we approved um you know um you know, a recommendation to the board to do some bike path maintenance, asphalt maintenance, as far as seal coat, slurries, um, you know, crack sealing, as well as limited uh, full depth repairs on certain sections. Uh, unfortunately, the, the weather turned cold pretty quick, so we were not able to do any of that maintenance activity in the fall. So it was uh, postponed to the spring, and now with the uh, pandemic you know everything was shut down so as of right now we do not know the exact date but talking with Sahail from CE Rain uh, he did mention that you know it is on his radar to, to talk with the um, the winning bid on that to see like, when they're thinking about an actual start date and hopefully the bridge being closed does not affect that but long story short it is going to be some bike path maintenance going on this year we don't know the exact time yet, but as soon as we do, we'll get the word out about that. Is there any questions or comments? Um, Carl, do you know anything that uh, might supersede what I've just stated? No, well, sir, you stated it very well, very succinctly, and um, that's where we stand at the township. Yeah, thank you. Hearing no other you know, questions or comments, we move on as far as education encouragement campaign. Um, so, you know, in the past we've done, you know, uh, walk to school day and bike to school day, uh, encourage folks to be a part of, you know, safety blitzes as well. Um, obviously with everything going on, with school not being in session, there was not a uh, walk to school day this year, uh, but there is something called, uh, you know, walk and wheel Wednesdays that's been going on through the Michigan Fitness Foundation. I can send a link out to that afterwards, but just encouraging people to you know, get out there, enjoy the, the sun, enjoy the, the fresh air, but do so safely when you're practicing social distancing. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, while uh, in the past we've been a part of a larger safety blitz for Walk, Bike, Drive Safe through uh, Southeast Michigan Council of Government, that is being, you know, scaled back a lot. But there is a new video uh, that's being uh, released this Memorial Day weekend. So uh, some of you may have seen that already on uh, Grozeal now I was able to post that 
essentially saying, hey, you know, there's not much, there's less traffic out there, but traffic is going at faster speeds. And at the same time, there's more people walking and biking. And so that, you know, makes for a more dangerous situation. So, to, you know, to be on the lookout for people when you're, you know, uh, driving your car, you know, people walking, people biking. Then when you're biking, make sure that you're practicing the rules of the road. If you're social distancing, you're getting away from sidewalks and share these paths, ride with traffic. And if you're uh, you know, a pedestrian and you're trying to practice social distancing and you're getting off the sidewalk and going into the street, then you'll walk against traffic um, because that's the best practices out there. So um, I will share that link as well. But you know, just good information to be practicing, none, you know, regardless. But especially in this time where we're trying to, you know, make sure there's distance between us as we're out there uh, recreating and exercising. Any questions or comments or anything else that folks want to talk about in regards to education and encouragement campaign? All right, uh, hearing none, we'll get to um, you know, some of the more you know, interesting items. Uh, this one is a little bit newer. Uh, BPAC has been talking about this you know, offline, you know, working with the township on this, but and as well as with the uh, wildlife refuge staff. But the idea is that hopefully we can, you know, uh, make a connection between Grow Road bike path and the uh, International Wildlife Refuge Gibraltar Bay unit um, by utilizing a service road that's currently on the airport property. The idea would be that you know, if costs allow. And uh, so far, you know, there, we don't know, have a reason to suspect that they wouldn't. Um, as well as, you know, as long as we get approval from the federal highway, uh, from the federal aviation commission, which so far it sounds like uh, it is possible that we'd be able to move that fence, uh, you know, approximately, you know, uh, you know, probably 10 or 20 feet to the west of where it currently is, in order to allow that uh, service road, which is not being used very much to be converted into a more primitive, you know, shared use path. So that way people could ride bikes, they could walk, they could hike, you know, from our bike path to the um, International Wildlife Refuge. So as of right now, um, Sahil at CE Rains is scoping out the cost for that. We're thinking about doing that in potential phases where, you know, one is looking at the bare minimum of moving the fence and then, you know, tearing down one fence and installing a new one on the proper, proper side. How much will that cost? And you know, is the, the path in good enough condition that there's no other improvements that are needed to you know, debut that path? Then looking at you know, what are some of the you know, um, improvements that could be done in order to make it more usable, make it safer or more appealing to folks. And those could include you know, limited drainage improvements. It could be adding more uh, you know, fines material so that way um, you know, it's less rocky, more of a smooth surface, or it could be actually um, you know, providing asphalt surface. Again, looking at the cost of those and figuring out is it something that can be done over time versus all at once. So hopefully we'll have more information in, you know, within the next month or so, but this could potentially you know, provide a lot of value to our residents and be you know, uh, an inexpensive uh, proposition. Carl, is there anything you'd like to add to this? It does appear that uh, we could do that. The report that came in from uh, Derek Thiel indicated uh, very positive that could be done. Uh, the question is, uh, where's the money gonna come from and can we possibly get a grant for that? Uh, I don't believe that it would uh, be prudent to go out and look to, uh, to do everything at one time at this point. A primitive, mm -hmm. like you might see at uh, um, Acadia National Park with uh, the larger base gravel and then uh, smaller pea gravel and things like that might be compacted, might be a good interim step. But at this point, uh, it's a question of money. Where are we going to get the money from? Mm -hmm. So so we can welcome Dan to the other call. I said he just came in. I just want to fill you in, Dan. We were talking about the um, wildlife refuge <clears throat> connector and how, um, you know, we're scoping out the cost for that and how it can be done in potential stages. So um, other thing to mention you know, about cost, you know, once we know what those costs are, we, 
we can look at uh, different options, including you know, is there a way to, um, you know, if we can't find funding, you know, the grant funding, is it something where we can do a, you know, just a, a fundraiser in order to help, you know, do some of these improvements? Have we heard back from um, Mike yet? I think it was Mike we were talking to. Yeah, um, so uh, via email probably like two weeks ago, Mike did get back to us with the results from his uh, aviation consultant right, that right, showed that. Right, I saw that. Uh, the, yeah, so um, after that, you know, I reached out to Sahil at CE Reigns. And so he's yeah. supposed to be, you know, obviously, you know, everything's moving slower these days. And so, you know, like the rest of us, he's working from home. So he told me that the information that we need for the historical aspects of like what those prices were for different you know, parts of the project is mm -hmm. back in his office. And so he was going to try and find those and you know, give me an answer um, you know, within the coming weeks here. So again, okay. hopefully by the next meeting, we should have more information on that. Okay. I know we, you, Mike said you, he was going to get back with you and uh, you were going to get with uh, Sahio. So I was wondering if you heard anything, but yeah, that sounds good. Cool. So Alan or Christine or Rebecca, do you have any questions, comments, things you'd like to add? Hearing none, move on. Uh, so the next item is, you know, what, what I'm calling more of the, the water's edge connector. So, uh, you know, in the past, we've looked at how do we tie, you know, our community to Trenton and the Downriver Link Greenways and the Iron Bell Trail, make those connections. And again, we've looked at multiple phases of, you know, doing that. And so one of them would be, um, obviously, it's, you know, connecting our path on uh, Meridian to the, the free bridge. But can you, you know, originally, uh, probably about a year ago, we reached out to residents and asked about Grozeal Parkway. We asked about uh, Douglas, which I, I believe it's Douglas, um, the name of the, the platted road that was behind the houses. Both of those options were not, uh, you know, favored by majority of residents. Um, another option was going down Bellevue with some sort of path or you know some other creative way of connecting to water's edge uh, so that way you know everybody could get to that community center people could get down to west river a little easier um, and so that's one of the things that we are looking at you know still doing there isn't a lot to report on at this time except for that's still on our radar and that you know we're continuing to have conversations with uh, the recreation commission and others about you know those potential paths um, you meet know, Dan or Carl. I know that you know you met with um, folks, so you know, maybe you have a little more to report on what's been going on behind the scenes. Dan, go ahead. Well, we met Carl and I met with Kim. She happened to be driving by over on Bellevue, and uh, we were explaining to her what we were thinking of doing. You know, asking her for ideas, and we haven't gotten back with. Anyone? And Carl was going to talk to someone at the country club. Uh, what their feelings and reaction to closing Bellevue or having it limited for emergency use only? Have you heard anything from them, Carl? I've not heard anything back on that. They're focusing on opening, uh, hopefully the week after uh, Memorial Day. Uh, I did speak with Kim about the cost of putting in. Uh, poles in a fence type barrier like you see at the, some of the ballparks to protect pedestrians as they are walking and bicyclists as they were riding along the proposed uh, area where we were walking which is the very east side of the second hole at water's edge and uh, the very west end of the Grozeal golf and country club property between bellevue and parkway um, she had um, just based on her experience and brief conversation, ballparked about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars for the cost of some kind of barrier to protect against uh, errant golf balls. So um, that is based on her experience in Maslin, Ohio, as well as uh, some of the work that uh, she was looking at with the Grozeal um, baseball 
uh, program through uh, through the REC Gyra, and uh, she was uh, indicating about twenty twenty five thousand dollars. That just includes the netting, isn't it? That doesn't include poles. That's it's a netting, like you see at some of the uh, some of the professional parks. Um, that was being proposed for the mm -hmm. new baseball diamond down in the airport Commerce Park fields, um, because that diamond was backing up against uh, wetlands and balls would be traveling um, potentially out into the parking lot. So they were looking at. Uh, the telephone pole and then the, uh, the loose mesh fetting netting that would uh, that would work so um she guesstimated around 20 to twenty five thousand dollars. yeah so for folks at home or you know, anybody you know uh, not intimate about this project what we're looking at doing is a variety of different options down bellevue you know, one could be wide paved shoulders which helps out from a biking perspective not so much from a pedestrian perspective it could be a formal, you know, shared use path along one side of the road, um, but you know, uh, preliminary cost estimates in order to make that you know friendly to all ages and abilities. So you know, make it ADA friendly, minim minimize slopes so that way people don't uh, lose control when they're going down a hill or you know struggle in a wheelchair trying to get up the hill. Um, you know, that would make the the project closer to a million dollars, which is you know out of our price range as of right now. Um, so you know, other options did include you know, um, you know, looking at you know, repurposing the roadway in some capacity, either you know, um, you know, one way or uh, you know, full road closure with um, emergency access for um, you know, emergency vehicles, so that way people could get through. Uh, and so looked at you know, one, you know, getting folks to, you know, from um, the bike path on Meridian to Water's Edge. And then from there, you know, how do you connect to the free bridge? And so there's, you know, two options that we're currently looking at. One would be more on the eastern side, you know, before, you know, in between Water's Edge and the country club. And, you know, you have that wooded area. And I know I walked that, well, I should say, you know, I rode my bike, um, you know, on the path. Um, the country club when it was closed and, you know, kind of scoped out that area. And in addition to all the woods, it was completely flooded. Um, so, it's you know, there bad. would be a lot of... What's that? It gets very wet on the water's edge side. Really wet. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like on the country club yeah. side, but in the past, when I worked on Saturday afternoons after a... It doesn't even have to be a heavy rain. It gets damp with a mm -hmm. light rain. Yeah, I uh, I took the path on the country club and then walked up to the fence, you know, closest to um, the West River connector. And, you know, looking over that fence, I mean, it was a full-on creek over there. So, um, you know, just to let folks know, you know, if we were to decide on that route, it's going to be a lot more than just, Fencing, you know, it's probably a lot of drainage improvements, and then area that's like doesn't see much sun is really damp. You know, how are it going to be for maintenance costs on something like that too? And then dealing with the terrain, so that's what brings up the other option of you know, can you do something along West River and make that connection? And so something that I'd like us to think about a little bit more is if we focus, you know, phase one being that connection to Water's Edge. And phase two being something like a sidewalk only on West River that ties into the existing sidewalk at the connector. So mm -hmm. um, you could still put up, you know, some fencing in order to stop the golf balls, but it's a lot clearer, a lot drier, a lot greater view, and you know, some aspects over there. You have and, a, you know, people will be able to you know, better understand it. And is it? You have a that, Dan? slope over there too along West River. So you're going to have to level that out. Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what I'm saying is, let, let's consider both options and figure out, you know, what's the best way to, to tie in because you, you touch that bridge, and you know, we're talking about something else over there. And so, and looking from a funding standpoint, you know, working with uh, you know, people that will be reviewing projects for state or federal funds. 
they're going to be asking, well, what are you doing taking a shared use path and turning it into, you know, uh, a very minimal sidewalk? Um, and, you know, so if we do that direct connection, shared use path, like through the, um, through the country club and through the uh, water's edge and then dump it onto the West River connector and then take up shared use path and put it right up against the, the very small sidewalk over there, that's going to raise some red flags. Um, so what I'm thinking is if you do a conventional sidewalk with, as like basically it's you know, a, t a separate project, you can do that as far as the connection between the country, um, between Water's Edge and, um, you know, the West River connector and tie into that sidewalk over there. That way we're not touching the bridge at all in that regard. And, you know, that section is just you know, a sidewalk connection, which makes sense because um, the Iron Bell Trail, uh, you know, this leg of it is considered the hiking route. So we want to make sure that we have pedestrian connections in that route. So again, I'm not you know saying that we choose one or the other, but I definitely want us to look at both options moving forward. Have you driven up and down West River very much since that? Since yeah. It, since it's cut off where you can't go underneath the bridge, I've noticed when I'm coming down to West River on the connector, these people don't even slow down. They just make that turn and. So we'd have to put some type of stop sign there or something like that. Otherwise, somebody mm -hmm. might get hurt. Yeah, I mean, th there's there's things that you need to look at, but you still have the same you know, traffic issues when you're taking people out from that area farther east and you're dumping them off right at that intersection of you know, the West River Connector and Grozio Parkway. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be dealing tra with traffic either way. Yep. Um, you're going to be dealing with golf balls either way. It's just, you know, what's the easiest way to, to move some dirt in and what's the easiest way to maintain it. Um, and so it, you know, I know that, yeah, there's some terrain issues, but it seems like the terrain is still pretty much a lot, you know, a lot leveler, a lot flatter, um, you know, a lot more room over on West river, especially if, um, you know, we have two sides of the road to be working on as well as, you know, we might be able to look at a little bit, you know, within the golf course. So um, different options to look at. Just want to make sure that the, the public knew that when you were looking at this, as far as a connection for, you know, value added um, connectivity. My only concern. Is there anything else anyone wants to. Yeah. My only concern sorry, Brian, is uh, when you go on that second hole, I, I envision having the same problem with water and stuff like that, that we have on horse milk. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're on, you know, if you're at that second hole, that would be an issue. But if you're in the road right of way, that, that, that might be, be a different situation. Yes, it would. That'd be. Yeah. I think that for maintenance purposes, I think that would be a better call. But we need to look at both of them. Mm hmm. So hopefully, moving forward, you know, we can find, you know, uh, a grant or you know something to like look at these in a little more detail. Um, and then you know, shop. once we were able to pick an alignment that we like, start shopping around to see if we can find grant funding for the projects themselves. I agree. Other questions, comments? Anything people want to add in? I'm good. Okay. Hearing, hearing none, the, the last part um, is about free uh, the Grosiel Free Bridge and potential improvements on there. So in the past, I've shared that you know, uh, Brian Loftus and I you know, tried talking with Wayne County about different improvements because ideally, you know, it would be great to have additional improvements on the free bridge or I should say even more ideally, it'd be nice to have a, free, you know, a new bridge completely that you know, serves all road users. Um, that's not in the cards right now. Um, you talk, you know, we talk about potential um, you know, modifications if you could, you know, hang a, uh, a shared use path along one side, could you widen the sidewalks on both sides? None of those are in the options as well. I know in the cards right now either. We knew that, but what we are asking for uh, potentially, and you know, Carl might be able to fill us in. Uh, but you know, we have. Uh, it sounds like there was support from the township administration to request that 
Wayne County, uh, look at the transitions between the sidewalk that is on the free bridge currently and, you know, where we have sidewalk off the bridge or the shared use paths. So, you know, removing all of the vegetation, uh, you know, making sure that the transitions are level and flush. And so that way, you know, somebody can, you know, uh, more safely travel along that area because we see people using it all the time. It's a safety concern. Hopefully that's something that they will be able to fix as part of the project and would not affect the scope or the cost for the entire thing. I did, uh, Brian, in response to your question, uh, two things spoke, one, number one, spoke with Dale Ream. He's going to be pulling as the township manager of the plans. Um, he does have the plans in his office. Um, most of the township has been uh, closed or limited access for the last uh, two months due to COVID-19, but he does have uh, the plans in his office and he has indicated he will pull those for me. We can take a look at that. Um, also, in speaking with uh, Supervisor Loftus, who has attended meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting with Wayne County, um, he believes that we have some time and ability to address that with Wayne County. They are just now starting to uh, do work on the bridge. They have to build what is essentially an undercarriage platform so that they can catch anybody that should slip and fall and any debris that might go in there. So while it doesn't look like they're doing anything on the top part of the deck, they are in fact doing a lot of work below the bridge. And um, Brian Loftus believes that we do have time to uh, address that with the county once some of these executive orders are lifted. And uh, again, Dale Ream is looking for uh, the plans and we'll be producing that. And I would look forward to a meeting where you and I and Dale and Brian could sit down and, uh, and review that and go into the options of uh, what we can do with the approaches and uh, there should be money available for that. Cool. Thank you for that um, additional information, Carl. Is there any questions, comments, things that people would like to, to see us like, look at as part of the review of the plans? Hearing none, we can go into a uh, report. So, Dan I, or Carl, do you have anything to report on in regard to open space or any other commission? We haven't had any. The open, the open space has had uh, um, a lot of use of the Meridian Elementary Trail across from Meridian Elementary um, in the woods there. And um, the good news is a lot of people are out there using it. The bad news is it's been pretty beaten up because of uh, all the wet weather we have. So if the trail is moist or wet, muddy, people are stepping off and uh, avoiding the mud and creating uh, uh, other bypasses, if you will, that then in turn become muddy and uh, a problem. So we're going to be addressing that as uh, the COVID-19 um, is able to allow us through the governor's executive orders to move on to uh, improving those paths. And uh, that's been a big uh, plus. I know when I go from my home on Ferry Road and Drive Meridian down to my office at the airport, we see an awful lot of people all times of the day using the uh, bike path and uh, pedestrian path. It's just really good to see so many people out. And uh, we haven't had uh, a lot of reports of any uh, vandalism or any destruction on any of the paths um, that have been reported to the police department. So I'm very happy and encouraged by that. People are getting out and using the uh, the bike path and it's very, very successful. And thank goodness we had that option for the community. Thanks, Carl. Dan, is there anything you wanna add? Uh, just the fact that we have not had a meeting since early March with open space because of you know the existing COVID-19, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. The other thing I would like to add also to what Carl said is on my trips to Kroger or Macomb Street, I've been using Bellevue a lot to see how much use is really going on there. And the number of people walking and biking on Bellevue, I've never seen so many people out there. So I didn't realize it got that much use, but it could be because everybody's home. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, Bellevue um, east of, I should say, you know, west of Meridian or Bellevue west. east of Meridian or both? West of, west of Meridian. 
I usually take West River up from Hawthorne Glen up to Bellevue, and then I'll head over to Meridian. And that's where I see a lot of people walking and biking. And the funny thing is, they go right down the middle of the street. Yeah, that's so probably better to be you know, conspicuous in that aspect, you know, rather than getting shoved off to the side of the road. I followed two young girls that were behind their parents, probably a good 30 feet. They weren't even keeping up with the parents. And uh, I thought it was unfortunate that the parents weren't behind them for safe, safe reasons. But mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just me. But you should take a peek at gotcha. it. Somebody you calling? Um, you know, there's a, an alarm going off in my house, just a, oh, okay. uh, you know, a reminder alarm. I, I will actually step away for a second and turn that off. I think that alarm was saying, hey, it's time to end the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so I guess, is there anything else that anybody wants to add uh, in regards to other reports or things that they've been hearing from other um, commissions or committees, uh, school board, anything else? They are going to start the uh, golf leagues at Water's Edge starting June 1st. I talked to Kim, uh, let's see, yesterday. Golf leagues, June 1st. Okay. Yep. Cool. Carl, she did, like she did tell us that afternoon, she did reduce the staff. It's just her basically in there most of the day, her and Annette. Kim and I, uh, spoke about two months ago when uh, early March about the uh, budget and where we were going with uh, the township. And I encouraged her as part of our conversation to look for ways to pare back because the anticipated uh, uh, falling in recreational activities that are such an important part of the rec budget. And she has cut back significantly on staff and uh, has really made a determined effort to uh, um, live within the revenues that are coming in and they're greatly reduced because of all of the um, loss interest or ability to uh, exercise um, with the recreation department. The programs are going to be down. She has done a terrific job to uh, reduce her costs and it's just an absolute fact of life that uh, we're all gonna be doing more again with less. And she's implemented programs at Water's Edge and Rec mm -hmm. Department to make that. Well, I'll be. Uh, Thanks, Carl. Um, I'll be starting at the golf course on Saturday afternoons, not this weekend, but the following weekend. Um, this weekend's the holiday weekend, and I've got some construction issues here at home. <laughs> gotcha. Carl, is there anything else that you'd like to report on as a you know, township liaison? Anything going on with the board? Nothing. Uh, we met this last Monday, um, and that was uh, a good meeting, uh, very productive. But uh, in terms of uh, going forward, um, I would indicate and put in a plug for, uh, again, COVID-19 testing. Uh, Brian, I saw you. Uh, you there on May 9th, Saturday, and, and thank you for doing that. That was great to see you and your family. Uh, I encourage everybody on Girls Eel to get tested. Our next COVID-19 testing is going to be Thursday, May 28th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., again at the airport uh, Commerce Park on the north side near the soccer fields. Uh, you're gonna enter from Meridian uh, just across from Rucker, it's on Intrepid, but the sign is not uh, there. But you will see 
on COVID-19 testing signs. That again is Thursday, May 28th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we're gonna be sending out a notice on all of our township media and uh, it will inevitably spill over into uh, other Facebook sites. Uh, I do encourage everyone to look at Grozeal Health Organization. Again, Grozeal Health Organization on Facebook and uh, they will have updates as well as the forms that you can download. This time you're going to be able to download the form and uh, have that available on a PDF and send that to uh, Dr. Janeski's office and we can proceed to go forward with uh, a more streamlined, faster format because of the use of uh, downloading online. Um, but if you don't have access to the forms, we will have the old fashioned handwritten that you can use there. Um, if it is raining on Thursday, May 28, our next day is the rain day, Friday, May 29 same times 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, these are going to be covered either by your insurance or the tests are going to be uh, covered federally. What happens is they are submitted to Beaumont Hospital. Beaumont Hospital then um, sends the bill to the um, state of Michigan as part of the disaster relief that we have um, um, funded from the federal level. So please everybody come out get tested. It is a short swab. I have done it. Uh, it is painless. Um, kind of a strange sensation when you have uh, the swab uh, being applied to your nostrils, but at the same time, it's being done under the supervision of doctors. So please come on out Thursday, May 28. If there are any questions, um, you will see the contact information on all the Grozeal uh, media and that will include Dr. Janeski's office number. And if you have any questions at all about what you see or about what you hear, you should feel free to follow the uh, telephone number on those forms and give her office a call. But we're looking again for everybody to test the Thursday after Memorial Day. Come on down. And that concludes my uh, report. Thanks, Carl. Carl, can I ask I a question? One question for you. Oh, sorry, sure. I'll, let it, then I'll let everyone else go first. Go ahead, Rebecca. I was wondering if you could explain why someone who's been completely isolated should still go and get tested. Because somebody of different, back in your house. Couple of, uh, couple of different reasons, Rebecca. Number one, um, if you have been completely isolated and are free from that, that is absolutely wonderful. But we're also looking for a database uh, to be compiled, essentially a picture in time where you would be able to show that this is what the community looked like. On the testing that we did have on Saturday the 9th, uh, Dr. Janeski's team uh, and the doctors that worked with her uh, tested 1,502 people. We had six that were outright positive. Um, I believe, my personal belief is the number may ultimately be higher because some people came with friends and others that were not socialized, isolating so well social distancing. And uh, it's my belief that some of those people are now going to be found to be positive as well. But if you're inside your home, that means that you are doing something well. Um, if you have groceries delivered, uh, that's a great idea. Um, it basically means that you're doing everything well, but still it does not mean that somebody who delivers the groceries to you or someone who has delivered even to your porch um, may not in some way or manner um, pass that along to you. So two purposes is one to keep you and your family safe. And the second purpose is for the database. One thing I'll add, Carl, that I've been doing is anything I bring in, including the mail, I sanitize everything. Um, you know, the history with my wife with the kidney transplant, she's been out of the house maybe three times in the two and a half months. That's it once was to go to urgent care. Um, we, she just stays in and anything that needs to be brought into the house, I do it. And I've been tested twice and had come back negative because of the care that we do. We were, I was again, Rebecca, um, Rebecca, um, you know, recognizing you're staying home um, I don't know about your family situation. I do know that you have children. We've discussed the, uh, that element uh, of your life before. 
And uh, there are just so many different ways um, through personal contact primarily. There seems to be some evidence if uh, uh, we watch the news that there's some limited ability to catch it by surfaces. But uh, ultimately there is a tremendous sense of relief when you get tested. I was tested on uh, Monday night and uh, received a phone call this morning indicating that uh, Carl, you're negative. So the first test that I ever wanted to fail and it came back a negative. So <laughs> relief with that. I, I think that was wonderful. So three well, reasons. Um, one is to help the community with a database. The second is to uh, confirm that you and your family are all negative. And the third thing is uh, putting your mind to ease that at least for this period of time, uh, you do not have an infection and nobody else in your family does either. So, you know, you get an A plus on your report card. That's cool. Could you have done better? Hey, just be happy with, uh, with the good health that you have and uh, be a part of the community and make a difference if you can. You do not leave your car. You do not gather with a group of people outside and stand in line for testing. Uh, you literally pull up, uh, roll your window down. The doctors give you the swab kit. You do the application. It's not something where uh, they even reach into your car or um, do the application for you. They merely make sure that you uh, press the swab far enough to get a good sample. You put it back in the vial. They cap it and send it off to the lab for testing. It's an FDA approved swab kit. It's also an FDA approved lab. It's the real thing. And it's covered by your insurance. If for some reason you don't have insurance, uh, the state of Michigan should be covering it through the disaster relief. So a lot of good reasons to do it. I really can't think of a good one not to. So when come on down. It, Carl, we were backed up almost to Meridian and it took us an hour and 10 minutes. That's the uh, best hour and 10 minutes you can spend. I would agree. And uh, we had uh, 1,502 people that tested. At one point, the line did stretch back to Meridian Elementary, which is about six tenths of a mile, but it moved. And uh, I was out helping with traffic. Uh, Supervisor Loftus, Clerk O'Connor, Trustee Nelson were all working on statistics and on the forms. And we did not have any of us have a complaint from anybody. And in fact, um, a lot of people said, hey, can I, can I bring you back a pop? Can I bring you back a water? But most everybody said thank you and God bless you for doing that. I really encourage yep. you, Rebecca. It, it's a good it's a good thing to be able to step out and do, and you'll have the relief and um, satisfaction of knowing that you're not spreading anything for any reason to your children. And uh, right now, there's more evidence coming out that it is um, done by an absorption through the eye of some of the particles that uh, come out in the mist when somebody coughs. So think about it. Come on out and join us on Thursday. I'm gonna be there. Did anybody so, else have any Carl, questions? Carl, just to clarify, yeah, is this the same test that was done last time or is this the antibody test? No, sir, this is the same swab testing that we have. Um, the antibody testing, we are hoping, Grozeal Health Organization is hoping to be able to um, obtain some of those kits. That's the test where you want to you wanna have a positive for it because it shows that you've had it before. Um, and that now you have the antibodies that uh, may help you fight it off. Um, I leave it to the doctors to explain whether or not you can be reinfected or not. The, I don't think the last word has been heard on that. But those tests, there are a lot of them out there. Um, there are some that are FDA sanctioned. There are a lot that are not. Um, I have heard stories of people spending uh, $35 for a test kit and the doctor's office is shut down. This is up near Utica, I believe. Um, people that have gone over to the Meyer parking lot in Southgate um, are charged $250, which is the same as a emergency room call, um, entering in through the emergency room for testing and care. How that happens, I don't know. I know these doctors are putting an awful lot of their own time, their own money, they're paying staff to come in and work on this. When we went on May 9th, they were on call that weekend. And I know one of the doctors was up making rounds at 4 a.m., came in and worked the COVID testing for about 10 hours between setting up and breaking down and was still on call for the rest of the weekend. So they have put their heart and their soul into this. And if anybody can you know, come out and take the test, 
it will help the community and make this uh, make this island a better place. Please come on out. You know, you can also go to Sam's Club with Quest. And I had it done there, I think, either the week before or two weeks before. You make an appointment, you pull up, you, you give them your sheet with your code on it. And the next thing you know, you're the next one in line. And it, you're all by yourself. There's There was no line. I pulled in at my, I was supposed to be there at 1040, pulled in at 1035, went right up. I was gone by 1040. I mean... To me, it's the greatest thing in the world to know that you're safe. And I agree, Carl. Everybody should be going, going down to the island and doing it. Great. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate the, all the work that you and everyone from the uh, Health Association is doing to you know, make us safe. And appreciate you for you know, getting the word out about it as well. Um, last thing I have on the agenda is the chair's report. I'll keep it brief, but I'll just mention that in addition to uh, you know, the work that we're doing here from a SEMCOG perspective, that there is still the uh, the ways to share information about you know, staying safe while getting out and walking and biking. Um, and I wanted to share with you some statistics that uh, I just recently crunched. Uh, you know, SEMCOG has purchased Strava data, and you know, Strava is an app that you can put on your phone or you can have it on your a uh, bike computer, um, you know, other devices, but essentially it uses uh, GPS pings to identify your location and be able to help you understand how you were performing from a bicycling standpoint, from a, a, a walking or running standpoint, uh, potentially for kayaking and other sports, but you know, primarily walking, biking, and uh, running. And so you, you can use that information to see, hey, did you, how fast are you going? Is there certain legs that you're going faster, but, you know, slower? How did you compete against yourself in, you know, previous times that you've gone out? As well as there's this um, you know, social networking aspect where you can, you know, race against some of your friends and see, like, you know, who did a better time. Um, but the point is that this app, you know, collects data that they're able to sanitize. So it does not include anybody's personal information at all, but it's able to take, you know, those GPS locations and, you know, uh, assign it to a roadway or assign it to a trail uh, and be able to get relative usage, uh, you know, for, you know, those roads or, or trails over periods of time. And so we were able to purchase that information for all of Southeast Michigan and as part of the bicycle and pedestrian plan, we included like where there was hot spots from a walking perspective, from a biking perspective, and both. But you know, additionally, we've been uh, you know using their app in order to look at progress over time. And something that I just crunched, which I thought was interesting, is that you know looking at uh, the month of March and April of this year, 2020, versus 2019. Bicycle trips in our region are up by 110 percent, and you know walking and running trips are up by 130 percent, and the number of people out there walking, biking, or running has increased by nearly 80 percent. So you know those are some you know staggering figures to see about you know how high activity has been. I'm sure everyone anecdotally has looked out their window and seen a lot of people you know walking, biking, or running. Um, you know, it's, but this is information that it's probably under reporting because it's, you know, it has to, be, you know, it's only the people that have the app downloaded on their phone, turned it on and consented to allow this information to be used and met a certain threshold in regards to, uh, you know, a number of users in order to protect uh, individual privacy. So, um, you know, there's a lot more people out there that don't have the app and that don't have it turned on. So um, just goes to show you that there's lots of people out there walking and biking, and we want to make sure that when people are doing it, that they're walking and biking or, you know, driving safely. Is that S-T-A-V-A? Um, yeah, S-T-R-A-V-A. Okay, I didn't have the R. I just looked for it. Would I be able to use that on my treadmill? Um, you you potentially could you know i'm not sure how well it's going to work because you know you're staying in one spot um but you know if you just you know ran around your neighborhood or walked around your neighborhood 
did it while you were mowing the lawn, you know, <laughs> you, know you could uh, you know, you track that information. Yeah, that job going back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I encourage everyone to actually check out uh, just Google Strava Global Heat Map, and that's a free resource that shows you like a, a picture hot spot of what's going on like within the uh, region, or actually you know anywhere within the world. So that's free, but it just tells you a part of the story. It's just a picture that shows you, oh, that area is bright, you know, brighting, uh, lighting up more than this other area. It doesn't tell you the actual numbers associated with that or it doesn't let you know over periods of time. It's just like everything together uh, accumulated. Um, but, you know, you're available to do that as well as, you know, check out SEMCOG's website, and, you know, download the plan. Um, and that's SEMCOG, S-E-M-C-O-G dot O-R-G. Um, you know, we have a section on there specifically about Strava data, about bicycle pedestrian count, uh, interesting stuff out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to report on is that the League of Michigan Bicyclists is looking to create a program where they'll, you know, help install, you know, temporary pop-up bike lanes, you know, bu buffered bike lanes or protected bike lanes. Um, and so, you know, they don't have the, the funding in place for it yet, but it's something that they're interested in doing to help out communities that might be interested in doing protected bike lanes but are kind of on the fence. And you know, they might be, you know, by having these temporary ones set up, it would help convince, you know, local residents, local business owners, um, you know, the politicians involved, you know, anyone that like has a stakeholder with this, that they can at least better understand, you know, what these facilities are and like how much more safe or how much more comfortable people feel along them. So um, I just let the league know that, hey, you know, if we do come up with a, a project that does include you know, protected bike lanes, you know, maybe we'd be interested if they're able to secure the funding in order to, you know, to try them out. Okay, interesting. I'm going to go in and look at that. Cool. So that concludes my chair's report. Is there anything else that anybody would like to talk about before make a motion for adjournment? I have nothing further, Brian. I don't either. I don't either. <clears throat> Christine, you got anything? Nope, I don't either. Okay, I saw Rebecca shake her head. So, cool. Uh, no, with I'll that, make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Nice. All I right. Can... Looking good, Alan. Dan and Alan. <laughs> All, right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? No one opposes. Um, so close the meeting at 8.37 p.m. Thank That's you, good. everyone. Walk, bike, drive safe. Yep. Be careful. <laughs>